Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started. I mean, we'll have a few folks joining us. Um, and we're so thrilled that you could join us for um, We Are the Story, Let's Talk About Race. And today we're gonna talk about Sacred Invocations, which is Sylvia Hernandez's um, stunning exhibition that we have here at Textile Center currently. And I wanna welcome you all. First, I wanna just introduce our two very special guests, the first being Sylvia Hernandez. Uh, Thanks for being here, Sylvia. We're glad to have you here. Hi, everybody. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. So Sylvia is a celebrated master quilter who creates work addressing community and human rights issues. Sylvia exhibits nationally and internationally. She is a member of the Studio Art Quilt Association and the American Quilter Society and served as president of the Quilters Guild of Brooklyn from 2011 to 2015. She teaches at El Puente Academy for Peace and Justice and Independence Senior Center and has worked with Edge at Arte, a social justice group that leads educational programs in marginalized communities. And of course, both Sylvia and Michelle are members of Women of Color Quilters Network, which is our partner with the We Are the Story initiative. Uh, welcome, Michelle. We're glad to have you here as well. Thank you. Uh, Michelle is a self-taught quilter living in Philadelphia, where she works as a full-time lawyer for the city of Philadelphia. Michelle is a member of the Women of Color Quilters Network and has the privilege to be included in many exhibits curated by esteemed quilt artist and historian, Dr. Carolyn Maslumi. Michelle's quilts have appeared in Quilt Mania magazines and most recently in Resurgence magazine in connection with the Textile Center exhibits. So we're so glad to have you here. Thank you. This week, we're kind of converging on two different programs uh, with Textile Center. Um, the first being the We Are the Story initiative uh, with our partners, Women of Color Quilters Network and our curator, Carolyn Maslumi. And I would just wanna give um, a thank you to our sponsors for the We Are the Story, Moda Fabrics and Supplies, the Rosemary and David Good Family Foundation, eQuilters.com, and the Minnesota State Arts Board, as well as our presenting partners. And we're also doing, this week is a special Fiber Art for All week that we're doing here at Textile Center. And we're doing this virtually as a national program. And we have an online auction that's taking place right now. It's running from uh, Sunday through this coming Saturday. And we have 200 items up for bid. And I know Marilyn Hamilton, who's on, the, uh, on this program, attending. She has, a, I think, two quilts in the auction, and I'm sure others of you as well. I have Gwen Chagrin, and I see other names that I can, on the screen here, but do check out the auction. That'll be put into the, the chat function, um, and we want to thank our sponsors for Fiber Art for All. It's our way of celebrating fiber art here in the midst of a long Minnesota winter, and also as we are enduring this pandemic, we want to celebrate the best of fiber art this week. And Minnesota Contemporary Quilters is one of our sponsors, Knit and Bolt, which is a wonderful shop here in Minneapolis. Cultural Cloth, a shop that is located in um, Maiden Rock, Wisconsin by Lake Pepin on the Minnesota border. Cherrywood Hand-Dyed Fabrics, MHD Couture, and the Quilt Shop Co-op based here in the Twin Cities. So we are very grateful to our sponsors. I just want to give a brief overview about We Are the Story before we dive into the discussion with Sylvia and Michelle. Um, when George Floyd was murdered back on Memorial Day this last year, uh, we all, Minneapolis was really jolted by this terrible tragedy. And there was really issues among the arts community, our community as a whole, all discussing the issues of racism in our society. And I reached out to Carolyn Maslumi, who's a member of our National Artist Advisory Council. And she had um, actually come up with the idea of a curated set of exhibitions. And we jumped on the opportunity to work with Carolyn on this. So there's three group exhibitions and uh, so, uh, four uh, solo exhibitions. But before I go any further, I have to say, Carolyn has been tireless in promoting We Are the Story. It's been in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been many publications that have covered this already. If you go to We Are the Story on the Textile Center page, you'll find a listing of all the newspaper and all the press that we have received. And um, we are really grateful to Carolyn for all that she's done to facilitate that, that coverage of this very important topic. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Carolyn and congratulate her for her 
wonderful fellowship that was announced a few weeks ago. She's one of 60 distinguished American artists to receive the 2021 USA Fellowship. So I just want to say congratulations, Carolyn. We are so thrilled for you. It's just a wonderful acknowledgement of your work. So as I said, We Are the Story is a set of um, exhibitions and there's three group exhibitions and I'm gonna go through those very quickly here. We opened this fall with uh, Gone But Never Forgotten, Remembering Those Lost to Police Brutality. And we had this exhibition here at Textile Center. It featured, I believe it was about 27 quilts and it was a juried, a juried um, a call for art. And um, this is currently on exhibit down in Lanesboro, Minnesota. Lanesboro is this wonderful little arts town down in Southeast Minnesota. And this will be up till April 1. So these quilts are available for viewing down in Lanesboro. Coming up uh, next month in March, we will open Racism in the Face of Hate We Resist. And this is a larger show. I believe there's about 60 some quilts in this show. And among those is Michelle Flamer's Dear White People quilt. And I thought, Michelle, maybe you could comment on this quilt that we'll be seeing starting next month. Oh, sure. Thank you, uh, Carl, for that opportunity. Um, so uh, it's, it's difficult to see it in the slide presentation, but it's these are crazy pieced letters that spell out Black Lives Matter. And the quilting has the, um, the symbol of the, uh, the, the fist, the upheld fist. Um, and their little um, embroideries. I use traditional crazy quilting techniques, so it's hand embroidered. And um, I've honored uh, George uh, Floyd in, in, this, in one of the letters, um, as well as John Lewis and um, uh, Trayvon Martin and just other um, people that came to mind as I was putting the quilt together. It's called Dear White People because um, <laughs> I, I go to a church that uh, believes itself to be diverse. And when these e events were happening this summer, we had some dialogues about the events. And uh, one of the more prevailing themes was, well, Michelle, don't all lives matter? I don't really understand why you have to say black lives matter, all lives should matter. And it's like, well, you know, we know all of the responses. Well, you know, when all lives, when my life matters and your life will matter too, and that type of thing. But um, that, that's pretty much why I came up with the title of this Dear White People. So this quilt for me represents an open letter to white people who really don't understand what the Black Lives Matter movement is about. Um, and they, um, it's, it's something for them to understand. So it's like a letter, a communication. Well, thank you, Michelle. We're really honored to be able to present your quilt. And I see some names of people in our, in our chat or in our room here who also have quilts in our exhibitions. And we're so glad that you're with us today. The other group exhibition that we did this fall that helped open We Are the Story is uh, the Women of Color Quilters Network's touring show, We Who Believe in Freedom. And so we had the, the Minnesota premiere of this show at the American Swedish Institute from September 10th through November 1. And it was a phenomenal show. And it was a real privilege to have that here in our community. And I would like to point out that um, Sylvia, you had two quilts in this show, and I thought mm -hmm. maybe you could just comment because many of us saw these quilts over at the Swedish Institute. Uh, yeah, well, uh, the first one, the racism one, came up um, as a challenge. We were given words, and we had to show them in a piece. And to me, it was like, how can I show this one word in one small quilt? I can make 12 of them and still not be able to say the story. But I picked a few things that I thought were, were important in racism. And it was Henrietta Lacks, the fact that her, her genes were taken and used and the family got no reparation, the lynching, the, the hoodie for uh, Trayvon Martin. And the island scene is uh, in Puerto Rico in the 30s, they, some factory decided that they wanted to sterilize all the women so they wouldn't miss work. And they, uh, and they did. They told them they had to go in there, check up, and, and they would just sterilize them. And then 20, 30 years later, there were no little kids. There were, there were no kids because they got rid of all of their possibilities of having children in that one town. So it was things like that that I wanted to include in, in that one piece. And, and the other one was for uh, Black History Month. I wanted to do something with the students to show them. So that's how I did uh, that one. That was why I did that one with Martin Luther King's quote about love. 
Well, thank you. And so I am uh, having a little technical difficulty. I just was pointed out to me that I had the wrong screen up for my screen share here. So I'm going to try to do this again so that you can actually see these quilts in full mode. So um, one second, bear with me. Sure. Um, play from current slide. Okay, are you seeing the full screen or are you seeing my presenter view? No, the presenter view is what's coming up. Okay, let me try one more time. I had this all worked out. No worries. So, I, 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 love, I, I love your calmness, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah. I'm gonna try That's the biggest time. problem we have today. It's, it's okay. It's a good day. <laughs> True, right? So let me. Um, okay, so I'm going to try this and see if. Let's see if. Whoops. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I'm going to close that out and try one more time. Well, I'm going to just move on to the next one, Michelle. While I'm trying to get this up, maybe you could talk because I think you can kind of see um, it's actually behind you on your screen. So, oh yeah, the, so, so can... I, I can speak really briefly about this one. Um, this is a pretty old quilt. I, I created a couple of years ago. I'd say maybe in 2010, 2011. I can't remember. Um, and it's um, <laughs> it's called History Lesson, and it's. Um, it was, it represents all of the things, I'm 64 years old now, and it represents all of the names or labels that I have been given in my life. Um, I started out as a child, I was known as Negro, colored. Then during the 60s, we have the whole Black is Beautiful movement. And um, then it was Black, then it became Afro-American, then it was like, no, that's a hairstyle, so now it's African-American. <laughs> And on the back of the quilt, and this is why um, it's somewhat controversial, and I think there's some places that would not be brave enough to um, post the quilt. Um, I have the word nigger in backwards, and the whole back of the quilt is red, which to me represents blood and oppression, and I have the word, uh, you know, nigger uh, written uh, backwards on, on, on it, because, because um, under it all, that's what I've been called. Yeah, that's true. So that, that quote really speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So can you see the full screen now or is yeah. it still? No, oh, it's, it's good. It. We can see it. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. No <laughs> you just have to go with the flow, as Sylvia says. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. I mean, that was a really powerful mm -hmm. exhibition. And then, um, so now I need to get back to... So We Are the Story also featured um, four solo exhibitions. Let me see if I can get that. So Dorothy Burge with I Wish I Knew How It Feels to Be Free, we had that presented at Textile Center during the fall. And it was just really an amazing, uh, an amazing exhibition. All these are available online virtually. And we have also a recording of a talk with Carolyn Mazlumi and Dorothy Burge about this exhibit. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a really great video. Um, to hear about this, this exhibition. And we will be presenting this in the spring at a location to be announced soon here in the Twin Cities. We also have currently exhibiting as We Are the Story, the protest series by quilter Penny Mateer of uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, this is up until March 14th. So there's still time to go see this, uh, these wonderful quilts at the Weissman. And then Freedom Rising, I Am the Story, Lemurchie Frazier's quilts will be up all the way through September 19th at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And so I have yet to go see this actually in person. I can't wait. Um, it's actually exhibited in two small galleries at, at the Art Institute. So, you know, if you're here in Minneapolis, please be sure to check it out. And I know this is being presented virtually as well by the Art Institute and uh, with a link from our website at textilecentermn.org. And then we leads us to Sacred Invocations, the quilts by Sylvia. And so this is up through March 15th. And um, Sylvia, it's a real privilege for us to have these quilts in our space. And I mentioned to you last weekend, to be able to walk by these quilts every day 
is just a real privilege. And we're so grateful to have them here in our space. And I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Michelle and Sylvia for their conversation about sacred invocations. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I, Sylvia, I have really looked forward to this conversation with you. Um, <laughs> it's a shame, I've only met you virtually. I've been a very um, long time fan of, of your work. So this should really be wonderful. And, and just so everyone understands, we will um, have a little bit of time possibly toward the end for a few questions. If you have questions, um, I think you've already been instructed, but I'm just gonna repeat it again. You can put them and write them in chat and um, you know, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and I believe as we um, have this conversation, we'll have some of Sylvia's quilts uh, back up on the screen so we can look at them. Um, so let me just start. Um, yeah, this is perfect with liberty and justice for all. So Sylvia, I think you regard yourself as a storyteller um, when you make a quilt. Can you talk with us a little bit about how you approach your storytelling um, and, and how that also relates to the title of your solo exhibition here, um, Sacred Invocations? Uh, well, I, yeah, I do believe I am. I started off making regular quilts like any other quilter that started out, but um, I found myself geared toward storytelling more so because I think it's a uh, it's a platform where, especially with young people, where if you give them too much information or tell them to read, you lose them. So if I give them something graphic that they can look at and see, and and then it might invite them to do research and look into things. That was why I went towards this more. Um, sacred invocations came up. I can't really remember if it was a poem or something I read and. And it just made me think of uh, George Floyd uh, calling to his mother. And that, that, that feeling that you have when, when you feel like you need your mom. And so it was important to me to, to use that name. Um, this particular piece came about with the children dying at the border. It was just heartbreaking to me. And, and I wanted to use a red, white, and blue, but in a very light kind of a way in the background. But then you think about what's going on, what's been going on, and it's it's not with liberty and justice for all for black and brown people at all. It's just not the way it is. It's like there's one set of laws for this group and one set of laws for this group. So it, it's it's something that I think that speaks to a couple of things, which is I think important to tell to make people want to try and understand and look into this. I think you told me when we spoke earlier that your stories are a jumping off point for personal yeah. exploration. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So when even when I put the descriptions in for quilts, I give you an idea. I give you the, the what I see at the beginning. I feel that if you give them too much information, then they're done with the piece and they move away. Mm -hmm. But if you give them a hint of what this is about, what this is trying to say, and it gives them, uh, it gives people the, the, the want to do research, to look into a subject or a theme or something to try and see if they can understand it in a different light. It's really fascinating because when I look at liberty and justice for all, I see the humanity of the children. So for right. me, it almost speaks as a baby quilt. I see yeah. tender little children, pink and blue, mm -hmm. but you're right, it is red, white, and blue in a sense as well. So I mm -hmm. guess, yeah, that's what you're talking about, that deeper meaning that you have in your quilts. Yeah, it's like, it's like hiding a story in the story. So yeah. it's a little something that you need to look into. And, and, and I believe that the, the pattern is the courthouse steps. It's like, <laughs> which is something also that it's important to try and include. A lot of quilt blocks have certain names that you can use to include in your work that helps you tell the story if you're gonna use it in the back. So that's why uh, this one in particular came in that way. Now, I know in your um, earlier career, you were a medical professional. Yes. So how did those, how did those experiences um, influence you as a quilt artist today? I, I see a lot of empathy that, that just slaps you in the face when I look at your quilts. Well, I, I, was, I started in medicine in 1978. 
And so it, it was when medicine was just, I, it was really, it was really like being in the wild, wild west back then, honestly. I, I, stuff was done with our gloves, rewashing tubes. Anyway, but it was always that I remember my first patient was a little boy that was brought in. He was playing with matches with his friends and they threw a match on him. And this little boy was sitting there burnt and his family brought him into the doctor's office. And the doctor told me, sit with him until the ambulance comes. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I wanted to cry with him. And, but it's that feeling of just being there for somebody to, to acknowledge, I, I know you're here and I know you're hurting kind of a thing. I mean, I worked through the, when the AIDS epidemic came in, all these young men that came in whose families didn't want to have anything to do with them. And I would sit and hold their hands and, and I got yelled at once for giving them water in a, in a cup that was not disposable. And it was like, give me a break, man. Come on. I mean, this is a human being. We're not talking about animals. Right. So it's just having that ability to sit with somebody. And I think now with COVID going on, it's, I, I can't even imagine these nurses, what they're going through, having to, to be everything for these people as they're going and as they're sick. So it's, yeah, it, it has to be some kind of compassion. It was, it, I loved working in medicine. I really did. But then it became something more than medicine became co-pays and what insurance you have and mm. and you have this much time for a visit and it was like who's taking care of the patients i want to know who's talking to them who's were sitting you, them and asking them the real story of what's going on so were, were you quilting at all during that time uh very little i started in the 90s mm -hmm. in the 90s i started early 90s i started quilting um mm -hmm. so it was just a way of finding another way because I always wanted to go into illustration. When I was a little kid, my dream was to be an art teacher. So I wanted to be an art teacher. And then life got in the way and I had to work. So I started working in a doctor's office. And 30 years later, I started doing something I really wanted to do. But instead of a paint and a brush, I went to fabric and told my stories that way. And went what, what led you to fabric instead of the paint and a brush? I, you know, I wish I... I knew my, my younger son, Teddy, tells me that I must have been a quilter in my past life because it stayed with me. Uh -huh. And I, pick up, I picked up and started doing it as if it was something I'd been doing all my life. Me and my mother used to sew when we did a little bit of sewing in school, but it wasn't anything. There were no quilters in my family. I sit down and I just started doing this. I, would, I, I didn't know about the fabrics. So I would buy pillowcases and started practicing with that. So you, you, know, were packages the, you were the classic self-taught quilter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went on from there. And then it's now I have a mountain of fabric and it's, and it's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Just, yeah. So but, that's then, a segue actually. And, and, and I, I apologize because we sort of had an arrangement of these slides, but now I'm sort of doing a segue into yeah. your time working with children yeah. Um, you were actually then able to take that that bridge from being a medical professional to working with children and, and quilting full time. And, and it's and it's I've done younger children, but the majority of the time was high school students. Uh -huh. And uh, high school is a is a time already where your brain is going 50 different directions. So, um, yeah, so it's helping them to tell a story, but doing it in fabric. And I always refer to the when you were a kid and you had a coloring book and you had those big shapes and you filled them in. So this is the way I, I work with them. I usually cut out um, stencils for them and have them ready. Once in a while they'll do it themselves, but I get them to, uh, to tell the story. I tell them, this is our theme. This is what we're doing. I make an example for them. I tell them, this is the sample. This is what you're gonna go by, but you're not copying mine. You're gonna make your own. So I let them you know, put things into it or rearrange it the way they want to. And, and just to speak of this quote that's up now, the Black Lives Matter one, yes. um, when they did the mural in, uh, in Washington, D.C. on Pennsylvania Avenue, and they showed the aerial view, the first thing I saw as soon as I saw it from up there was, that's a quilt pattern. So if you look at the aerial view of the top of <laughs> from where the, 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 this painting is on the streets on Pennsylvania Avenue, that's the top of the buildings. It was like, it's perfect. This is, that's the way that one came about. It's like, you never know when you're going to get inspired to create something and go with it. Well, I, I love the color palette that you've used for that quilt, the one that's on the screen now. And it, and it leads me to something else, the concept of black joy. Um, it's yeah. not a new concept, but it's no. getting a little bit more attention again. And um, 
So, and for me and for most people, I think, or many people, it represents uh, resilience and resistance, even in the midst of incredible oppression. Right. So we have black and brown men and women, you know, being executed disproportionately by police officers. And, you know, we've got bad water. We have children uh, separated from their parents at the border. We mm -hmm. have uh, the, the impact of COVID. Even now in the distribution of the vaccine, the inequities are exactly. um, incredible. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of all of that, there is something that, you know, is can you can still grab a hold of something that's hopeful and joyful i see that in your quilts uh i see it in the color palette but maybe there's some other things uh do you want to talk a little bit about that well i i've come to this point where it's like trying to tell a story even if it's a terrible sad horrible story mm -hmm. but doing it with dignity with color and with just bringing some kind of love and like you said joy to it you you bring a little something to um to catch the eye and to show the humanity of it. Um, because it's, you would think that black and brown people just kind of popped into the world and, oh, here we are. It's like, all of a sudden they discovered us. Like, no, we've been here all along. We've been doing stuff all along and working and struggling and doing what we have to do. Um, but again, like with this piece here from the Flint water, mm -hmm. I use the hint of the red, white, and blue. So you see the blue and the red and it's this the children, uh, just the people in Flint, Michigan, and what they went through, and 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 I wrote in Spanish because the the immigrants were not being given water because they didn't have proper ID. How can you not give them water because they didn't have ID? They were getting water at the church if the church had. So it was it, it was just heartbreaking to me. So it's again trying to tell a story that's heartbreaking, but with dignity and and love and a respect for humankind, which is all I try to do with my work. Right, you're showing the humanity of that little boy drinking water, something that every child does in a school exactly. of, you know, Carter and the water should be clean and it should be healthy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. So it's, yeah, it's just one of those things. That, and I, the, the image of the little boy was in an after school program that I used to work at and one of the boys went to drink water and, and I can't remember his name was Destin. And it was, I said, no, this is the image. And sometimes you see something that catches your eye and you want to show it again, but in for something else. So I was glad that I caught him drinking the water and I asked his mom and she said it was okay to use it in the in the quilt. So yeah, and I'm glad to honor him this way too. To That's show good. that they matter. Yeah, they matter. I mean, it's it's hard enough being a little kid, but when you treat it like you don't matter, it's it's tough. I'm sorry. It's just um, horrible. Mm. So, um, we want to talk now about your your actual your teaching, and I know because during the pandemic uh, you're not using a virtual platform, so you really are not working right now with the children. Is that right. correct? Yeah. Correct. But hoodies and the next um, quilt that we're going to see were um, a collaborative a collaborative effort, right, by the you and the children. Yes. Yes, well, we did the hoodies to to speak on the, the the police shootings, on the police brutality. Each hoodie has the name of a person that was uh, that was killed by police, their age, and the state they were in. And the students, some of them knew some of the names, but some of them there were no they had no clue who they were. So we went over it and we talked about it because I, I tell them because the school is majority, you know, black and Hispanic kids. So it was, it was important to be able to teach them that. What I thought was interesting is that if you could see in, inside the hoodies, there's different colored brown circles. And whenever I do stuff like this, I always put different shades of brown. And I always laid them out and, and the kids had really a hard time going towards the darker brown. And I would ask them and they didn't have an excuse. They would always try to go to the lighter ones. And then after we talked about it, some of them started you know, going into it and I said, no, we have to celebrate all the shades of brown. We can't go just to one side and say that this one's not the one I want to go with. Because like the experiment they did with the dolls, with the black and white dolls, if the kids only wanted the white dolls, they didn't want the black dolls. So it's mm -hmm. still happening now. It's still something that's in their heads. And these are black and brown kids, which was fascinating to me. It was like, wow. 
And, and then you're able that, to have a conversation with them, an honest conversation yes. about yeah. about race and a personal perception. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because yeah. unfortunately, like I said, they were high school students. So they knew about being stopped. They knew about being uh, slightly hurt, you know, being harassed by, by the police for no reason, for just walking and being in the neighborhood. So it didn't make sense. So it is. it was something that that I'm glad at the school, they, they have a platform where we can talk to the kids about these kind of things. And it's not something you can do, you have to. This is the world they live in. You can't teach them without teaching them about or talking about the stuff that's happening in the world. I think that's craziness to not be able to discuss this with, with young people in school. So we, have, yeah. have you inspired any of the children to take up a quilting or to, this introduction that you're giving them to art, have they taken that maybe and done some other types of um, art, artful expression with that? Do you know? Well, the, the school has a huge art department. Uh, okay. We have a great art teacher, Joe Matunas. He's a muralist. He's a, he's a fantastic photographer. So they have a great art program. And everything that we do has a social justice theme. Mm -hmm. So there, every all of this is discussed. It's not, you know, it's not just one strict uh, guidelines. They're taught about all these things, so they can understand the world that they live in. It's important. It's important. So they they haven't gone into quilting, but they each um, during the year they get to finish one personal quilt for themselves. So I bring in all the squares. They match them up. They use the colors they want, and once the squares are done, they give me the tops. I finish them all, and everybody goes home with their personal quilt during the year, oh. aside from the rest of the work. And, and they love it. It's they a really full size quilt? Is it a full uh, no, size they, quilt? No, no, it's like probably like 50 by 50 or 45 by 45, because it's not big enough. And plus I got to do them all. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're so happy and some of them save it. And the next year they come back and they say, now we're going to add this one to the last one. So they extend it from there. We keep adding them together, which is, which is fun. Or they give it to some baby that they know and they're so proud of them. So they take it home. And even like for Mother's Day, I made they made little simple things in fabric. Everything we do is in fabric, whether it's postcards or whatever. And I told them, they said, who am I going to give this to? So to your mother or some woman that you love for Mother's Day. Was, and they said, but, but I can buy one. I said, but you made her one. Can't you see the difference? And they will go, yeah. And then they come back on Monday. So like, she was so happy. I said, I told you. <laughs> you, right. you did. You went out of your way to do something to give. And that's important to them. So and the quilt that's up now was was done after the uh, the shooting at, uh, at that park in Florida. And uh, we were supposed to do Valentine's Day uh, stuff in that day because it happened in the morning. And I, everything changed. And I cut out the guns and I... I cut out flowers for them and I tell them, lay it out the way you want. But this is what we're talking about, school shootings, that you have to practice for, you know, uh, some kind of event at school that you have to hide, that the windows have to be shut, that you have to lock your doors. And, and it was crazy, but they understood and they went along. And, and it was another way of speaking to them about current events and stuff that's happening in the world. I see. Which is, yeah which I think was important with what happened on January 6th in, in, in at the Capitol, that now they understand what kids have to go through hiding and, and learning a new technique in life. It's like, yeah, no, this is not something that should have been taught to kids. This should have been part, should not have been part of their curriculum to learn to hide from a shooter. But. Absolutely not. Um, so during this uh, period of the pandemic, you're not with the children. Um, no. Are you quilting? Is this a struggle for you, or how how has it been? You know what? It's 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 like you know when you have when you're working like crazy and you say, "I wish I could have time off. I wish I could just take time off." And this has been a year of just working, of quilting and and creating. And 2020 was I I made so many pieces. I can't get over it. But it was so much going on. There was so much I had to say. I said, I can't go to bed with this in my head. I have to tell this story, even if it's in a little way. I mean, as you can see behind me, I make smaller pieces just to get stuff done and get them on a piece of fabric and, and get the story told because it's it's important, I think, to, again, so that people can discuss, so that this story can be told and not forgotten. And, and, and so, you know, this part of history will be remembered and this is what was happening. And not just in words, but in images so that uh, people can see later on. These are the things that were happening during the pandemic. So 
Yeah, because I don't, I think there's something very eternal about uh, the quilt making. I mean, you know, you look at these antique quilts, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't know the women, mostly women who made these quilts, but right. they're still there. And they're like a visual recording of, of their life. Right. Of what happened. No, exactly. And it's just, again, it's storytelling. I think it's all storytelling. If we don't tell our stories, who's going to say them? Who's going to tell them? They'll right. just lock them away and never be told. It's important. We have to, we have to really have to do this. Absolutely. Um, um, and this quilt, uh, I think this is the, the last of the seven that we, that we're showing here. Um, I think there's one more. There's one more. After yeah, this. That's right. There is one yeah. more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, this one came about because again, with, uh, George Floyd calling to his mom that I touched so many hearts, but I know it, it, I have two sons and they are the light of my eyes. These boys are everything to me. Um, and one of my boys, Miguel, um, he's a, an illustrator. He's a graphic artist and the drawings, the illustrations that you see here are his pieces. And then I put the rest together and it was like, it, this was our collaboration, our mother and son collaboration for me, at least it was, it was when I, I started doing this, I asked him, I said, would you mind if I use some of your work? And he said, sure. And he rearranged and he, and he did this. And, and it's, I think it's just so important because his illustrations say so much. The eyes speak to you that it's just something about them that were important to tell this story of, of you know, it's not that we have an attitude, it's you treat us like crap sometimes. So we have to have a bit of an attitude because if not, you're just gonna step all over us for real, like just right in our faces. So it was part of that. And, and, and this quote by Malcolm X was just like, yeah, this is obviously something that has to be said. So that was why this one came to me. It was, it was just my connection to my, to my son, Miguel, to, to make something with him. And we're starting to collaborate on other things now too, which is- Oh, that was my follow-up question because yeah. this is amazingly successful. So uh, you're gonna do something with him in the future? Yeah, yeah, we're working on some stuff. We're talking about stuff now. And uh, yeah, because his stuff is, I mean, I take some of his drawings, his uh, drawings and then uh, embroidery and sent them to, uh, I, his, his wife is in, uh, she's in Mongolia because her father's sick. And so his birthday came in, in October and I wanted to make him uh, 45 Halloweens because he's turned 45. So one of the pieces I put in was a drawing that he made of her, but I did it in embroidery. So tell him, so when you miss her, you can always touch her face and feel it with you. Sweet. Yeah, so. Very sweet. So things like that. Yeah. Um, so I think people will notice here that this is a <laughs> loan from the private collection of Spike Lee. That is the true Spike Lee. But I, I reserve this sort of toward the last. I want Sylvia to tell the story of this because I just think it's kind of funny. I mean, Spike Lee. Yeah. Healthy, so, right? so I was I was sitting in the studio working and I get a call. I don't know the number, but I pick up and and he goes, Sylvia. And I go, yeah. And he goes, this is your your brother from Brooklyn. And I said, no, my brothers are in Brooklyn, but OK. And then he said, it's me. It's Spike Lee. And he said, and it's not a prank call. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, no, really, it's not a prank call. It's really me. <laughs> he saw the article in the New York Times with one of my quilts. And he read about me and he supports Brooklyn artists. And he was just so lovely. He was just so friendly. And, and he told me that there was money burning a hole in his pocket. Well, tell him, well, let it burn a hole in my pocket, then send it over here. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. So, yeah, no, so he bought three pieces from me. Wow, that's amazing. And, and these are the three that are included in this um, solo exhibition, correct? No, there are two here. The other one was one that I had here. And okay. then... Yeah, th this one was the Corona one. This one I made during the beginning of the coronavirus. It was like how I got to tell this story. We have to, again, so people could know this is what we were going through. The virus, the washing the hands, the distance, the, all of this going on. So that was my point of making this one. And I, I just really loved the way it turned out. It was just, uh, again, it was one of those things. It was like, I got to make something about this, but I got to make it now. So there were weeks where I was cranking out two and three pieces. I said, what is wrong with me? <laughs> but it was just, there was so much going on. I had to really tell the story. And he picked these two at the beginning and then he picked another one. And then I gifted him one, and um, which was fantastic. And then, uh, yeah, so, so he's been a great support and I'm really happy. 
That, that is just an amazing story. I think most of us probably would have thought we were being punked by one of our friends or we would have thought it was a spam I, call and not answer it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, he's, he's very sweet and very down to earth. And it was like, I was very happy to, to, uh, to do this with him. And so as soon as the cool tobacco, they go to his house. <laughs> amazing. That's an amazing story. Um, yeah. All right, so I want to have an opportunity uh, to present some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. A few people are asking, while I go through this, this is a pretty easy one. Um, so generally, can you speak a little bit about your technique and your construction method? So people are asking, are you using uh, paint markers, paint? Are you hand quilting? Um, I, I do know that you do some, a lot of hand embroidery as well correct yeah yeah it's it's i do i do all of the above actually it, it is this particular one is uh, markers but i painted on them there's a great fabric paint that i've used that i enjoy using it's the quiet time of just sitting and, and coloring in all the words and uh at the beginning i would cut them out which i still do once in a blue moon but all of this is all applique it's one background and the applique um uh, but the background is pieced on this one yeah so i try to piece the background and do something in the background of all the pieces so that they can uh, so it's an additional thing to to whatever I'm doing um but yeah no it's it's and it's most of the time it's Roy's applique um with either some kind of adhesive in the back to to applique them down but yeah no it's it's, it's a little bit of a column a column b and column c I just to do it all and once in a while it's the embroidery just doing the stitches it's kind of therapeutic just to sit there and stitch and stitch, which I'm sure you understand when you're just working and, yeah. and stitching away. And it's just one of those things. Right. Um, all right, I'm going to, um, unless Ray, um, she's also um, helping out with the textile center on this. I have a, a few questions that are directly from the chat that I would like to just read. Um, here we go. Uh, so this is for you, Sylvia, of course. Um, how different is it for you and your audience to experience presenting your works online um, and versus having, you know, seeing them in person? I mean, let, I, I know quilts are, they're so tactile and yeah. so many people now will not be able to visit Minneapolis to see any of these quilts in person. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think the, the audience has been bigger since it, has been online, which is which is great, but it's always so much fun to be able to see the quilts up close. Because again, there's secret things that I put into quilts or little things I put in that if you see it up close, you'll see it. If if you're seeing it in person as opposed to seeing it in an image, and in person, the at least the one with the guns, um, I had that in an exhibit at a Brooklyn uh, uh, Guild show, and uh, I experienced grown men standing in front of it crying because it spoke of the shooting of the students, the shooting of kids, uh, the, the craziness of the mass shootings. So I've had people stand in front of my pieces and cry and it breaks my heart, but it's like, okay, this is exactly, it's reaching the point I wanted it to be, just telling the story I wanted to tell that this is something that, you know, that matters, that really matters. And it's important for you to take notice of it. So in that sense, but I, I think it's just been wider a wider audience since it's been online and it's been virtual. Yeah, and don't you think you can communicate these stories um, through the, the same the same way? I mean, you know, it, it's all visual. And right. yes, you're not standing in front of the quilt, but especially with the technology of photography now, you can actually see the quilting pattern yeah. in your coronavirus quilt and yeah. appreciate almost the, the texture of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which which I absolutely love because that's that's my my husband knows that it, that's my thing of when I make a quilt, the, I start off with, as soon as it's all put together or it's up on the wall, I take a picture of it or I look at it on my phone because if it looks good, if it the thing is it photographs well, it's going to be okay. Then then I know if I don't like the way it looks in the photographs, like we got to change something. There's something missing here, so right. that's my my uh, my litmus test for knowing if it's good or not photographing and saying oh yeah okay this is going to work because I can tell the story this way as opposed to something that you can feel and see on a flat surface you'll be able to see it and appreciate it 
we have some questions here and I'm going to paraphrase because there's more than one um, mm -hmm. from white artists who are saying that, you know, they want to, I, I suppose, um, express their art or, or express something about this, the police brutality. Um, mm -hmm. They want to respond to these things. Um, but, but then, but then they feel as though, well, you know, I'm not experiencing these things uh, directly or my, my family member, my, my brother, my sister has not been arrested by the police or, or um, something is, you know, I'm not living in the same environment as um, say someone who has to worry about drinking their water. Um, do you have anything to say to that? Well, I, I think it's, it's part of the research of trying to understand these things. And, and believe it or not, if you go online and you type in police shootings or, or you will get more white yeah. young men being killed by cops than, uh, than black and brown, believe it or not. Uh, it's just that we're saying, you know, this is enough. We can't do this anymore because they get a, sometimes a, a, a pass, but we do not. Um, I think it's just trying to do it in an understanding way to try to say, this is not, this doesn't affect me, but it affects the world. And I live in this world. So I have to be able to talk about this. Because right. you can't say what what happened in, in Germany happened to the world. It didn't just happen there. It didn't just happen to the Jewish people. It happened to humanity that this happened and people watched and didn't do anything. Right. What happened January 6th, people watched and accepted it. And it doesn't make sense. This happened to the world. It happened to our country. Mm -hmm. So you can't say, well, I don't know this. Well, I don't know about being a white blonde girl, but I can respect her and and you understand what I'm saying? I think my best story is during summer camp, I had a little a little girl. She was probably seven. She was this chubby little black girl with 12 braids in her hair, the cutest thing you can ever see. Mm -hmm. We were doing self-portraits. So I told her, this is what we're doing today. I did mine. She told me I did this in school. I looked in the mirror and I did this. I have the picture. Can I show you? I said, sure. She showed me a picture of a blonde white princess. <laughs> Is that what you saw? She said, that's what I saw when I looked in the mirror. I said, okay, so let's do a new one. Thinking that maybe with the different color browns and whatever, she did it again. She made herself a blonde white princess. Mm. My thought was, who told this beautiful black child that she wasn't beautiful? Who did this to her? Who, who had the audacity to do this to her? Mm -hmm. and so those are the things. So it's just being kind in the way you speak to people, being kind. And it's not just so creative, but say this is, not the way I want to see the world. That that could be the way you can put it. This doesn't affect me, but I don't want to see the world this way. This is not what I want for, for all the children, for the people of the world. This is not what I want. So maybe that could be an approach to, to doing this. Yes, because I, I think I think as artists, everyone is obligated to respond to their environment. Um, so you're right. We we live in this country, we see injustice. Um, we need to respond to it. And um, I don't really think that there, is, you know, I, I really don't think we can say, well, this group of people, they're going to be much more equipped to respond to this. I will probably as a black woman in this country respond right. to something very differently. Like for example, exactly. the statistic about the number of white people who are um, shot by the police. Yes, it is true. In terms of the number, there are more white people who uh, die at the hand of the police than black. However, it's a disproportionate number of, course. of the population of blacks and right. brown of people yeah. who are executed. But it's, no, it's I, basically needing to understand that and to be sensitive to um, those differences. Exactly. And, and, and not, not to... Um... I don't know. It's just not trying to explain your way out of a stupid comment that, that as you're saying, it, you know, it's stupid and it's racist. And it's like, oh, man, I'm going to get out of this. Just think before you talk. I've taught that to my boys all their lives. Think before you say what you're going to say, because remember, you're representing yourself. You're representing me and your father and your family. So you go out there and you act like a putz, then you're representing us. So think about that before you do it. <laughs> right. That's right. So it's little things like that. It's Baby steps. 
we got to take baby steps. There's no, this, this isn't, this didn't just start. This has been going on for years. And, and unfortunately it's been taught and put in some people's heads to be this way about that. And then I'm not going to say that in our own, in Hispanics, there's not racism. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It, it doesn't, it doesn't have one side or the other because Puerto Ricans come in every single shade you can think of. We have blonde blue eyes to, you know, very black. So it's like, yeah, no, it's, it's there. We just have to uh, not be it and, uh, and live your best life and be, you know, honest to yourself and be a decent person. That's all I can say. Right. And the story you told about the children, the two examples of the little girl, the, the camp and their children, yeah. the hoodie, that's very exemplary of, of how people view themselves and how art can help them identify these things that maybe they were not even aware of the fact that, oh, Wow, I'm I'm not I'm not really entirely comfortable with the skin that I'm I'm actually in. Exactly. So yeah. I had a whole conversation with one of my bosses who told me he told me, but you're white. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> so don't tell me I am. So you may see me without eyes of prejudice, but I walk out that door. I've been called on 59th Street, which is the high class, 59th Street, Lexington Avenue, which is super high end, the uh, Upper East Side of Manhattan. Walking through a tunnel, I was called a nigger as I was passing this man. Middle of a work day, it's like, there you go. Mm -hmm. It's like, and there you go. <laughs> so there it is. There it exactly. is. Exactly. Exactly. Some, some, somebody in the chat, I like this, uh, said, okay, Sylvia, here's a challenge. Are you planning to portray your conversation with that little girl that you have the day camp in fabric? Um, uh, Jul it's Julie Simmons, and she writes, it's a very important statement about who told about yeah. told her that she's uh, not as beautiful as she is. You know, it's definitely a piece in the, the back. It's like, uh, there's so many pieces in my head and just trying to get them out there. But that's, that's a story that it, it made me cry. I came home and I cried. I cried because I remember being the little girl that nobody wanted that my teacher told that I would never amount to anything. Teacher told me that when I was a little kid, why do you, why would you say such a thing to a child? And he was like, yeah, no, this is uh, yeah. So no, definitely it is It is a good piece because uh, like I said, she was just so beautiful. But I spent the whole summer telling her how beautiful she was. Every day she came in, I said, I love your dress. I love your hair. You look so pretty. Just I said, if nobody else says it, maybe she'll remember this whole summer, somebody telling her she was beautiful and that she was loved and she was special. Well, I mean, I think that's that shows through in your in your quilts, especially the one with the Flint, uh, Michigan, the little boy drinking the water mm -hmm. at the fountain, because you're taking something that is just so incredibly tragic and horrible, but you're showing, and it's also the one with the two children at the border fence. Yeah. You're giving, you're, you're communicating their humanity and and it's just a softness and a, and a beauty and a joy about it. Yeah, no, it's and it's it's different. It's really hard for me sometimes, but sometimes it just comes to me, and I'm so happy when it does. But it's again that that feeling that I have. How am I going to do this? How am I going to portray this in a way that's that shows humanity, that shows heart, but shows the horror of what it is too? Right. And it's like the racism piece I did. It was like, how can I portray such a thing when there's so many horrible things I, that I can talk about and just make this an ugly quilt? The button it's like, no. So I have to make it something that's. That you'll say, oh, that's nice, but oh my God, the story it's telling. I think that's the kind of you know reaction that I'd, I'd like to see people have when they see my pieces. That this is really oh, but that's what it's to have that kind of a moment. I think it's important because again, these stories have to be told, and if we don't tell them, they're just going to go away. And it was like they never happened. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Let so, me see if we have another question. Sure. We're getting almost at the end of our time. Let's mm -hmm. see. I actually did have a question that was a follow up to that. So when you are creating yeah. your quilt, how intentional are you to try to inject something uh, almost positive in it? So for example, the one in it, it's not on, on the screen, the one you did on racism that showed um, the, uh, the, the lynching and, you know, Trayvon Martin and the hoodie and all of those other images that, that just evoke terror, you know, yeah. to, to black and brown people. But, but then how, then how do you, 
when, when you're putting that together, are you also thinking to yourself in the back of your head, oh, but I, I don't, I want, I want someone to delve into this more deeply. So I don't want them just to react to the horror of it. Cause it's, I guess it's very simple to, to put something like that together, right. but then you're, you're missing the, the depth of the story. Exactly. The, the name of that piece is a glimpse at racism. Mm -hmm. So, so it was, it was like, how do I pick a few things to tell a story where imagery will tell part of the story, but you'll want to look into it. It's the perfect example is Henrietta Lacks. Yes. This hardworking woman who did nothing but go to the doctor because she was sick yeah. and lives on today. But you would think that they'd be statues to her and everything because what her legacy, but they're not. It was all the secret and, you know, and the money and let's keep it this way. And the sterilization in Puerto Rico. So, yeah, when I put people didn't know that. And I said, no, look it up. It happened in a lot of states, but it happened in Puerto Rico in more than one place. Right. Can you imagine a factory having the ability to, to say, well, we don't want to shut down. We got to keep working. And if they have kids, then they won't come to work if the kids get sick. But if we sterilize them all, then they have to come to work. Well, we can't imagine it. We can imagine meatpacking plants who didn't exactly. tell or who didn't yeah, exactly. to their people and they died of coronavirus. Exactly. Yeah. That was the other thing with corona because corona is affecting Hispanic and, and Black people. Uh, people more than anything else and it's like and we're the hardest one to try and get vaccine i've been trying to get a vaccine and calling and calling and waiting and we're hoping that before the end of this week we get an appointment but it's always and i and unfortunately you see it in medicine you see it i've seen the difference in how people are treated and uh in different how can i put it without i worked in clinics where where all the children and all the women got the same medication because they had a uh deal with the pharmacy and so everybody everybody got the same thing so that they could get kickbacks oh. but 80 percent of the children had asthma because the neighborhood the quality of the air was horrible and it was one of those things where you try to do everything to help them and try to tell them go to another doctor's office don't stay here and it was but you can't it was just it was happening everywhere i'm talking about the 70s and it yeah. was like uh, yeah so I, I had to leave because i couldn't do it anymore I would come home and then you carry that stuff home with you, the sadness of the whole thing of the, the lack of, uh, yeah, no. And then and, and I, and there was a report that the doctor said that, you know, the doctor would believe a man complaining of his symptoms more than he would of a woman. A woman is just being hysterical. Mm. And yeah. if I hadn't witnessed that myself, I would say that was BS, but I've seen it myself. Right. Well, we are happy that you found your way to this world of, of quilting and we mm. have all benefiting from it, um, your artistry and, and, and just your compassion and joy as a, as a, as a woman. I did certainly, uh, has just encouraged me just hearing your story and your perspective on um, what you've created here and, mm -hmm. and what you will continue to uh, do in the future. And I see uh, Carl is back online. Is mm -hmm. back. Well, I want to thank you both, Sylvia and Michelle, for a fascinating conversation. I mean, it was really <clears throat> amazing. And Sylvia, we've had your postcards in our retail, our artisan shop during the holidays, and I believe they're still in our shop now, and they're just wonderful. So you can thank always you. purchase uh, Sylvia's work. I see Carolyn is here, and Carolyn... Yay, Carolyn. <laughs> She's applauding. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to share, Carolyn, about the We Are the Story project or anything in general? I just want to say this was just a fabulous conversation. Absolutely great with two great artists and both, both making significant art that uh, tells our story every day, past mm -hmm. and present. So you both did a great job. I'm happy and I'm proud. I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you. That means hey, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, Textile Center is a national center for fiber art based in Minneapolis, and you can visit our website, textilecentermn.org. Uh, check out our We Are the Story page on our website, and there's a link to Women of Color Quilters Network as well, which uh, Sylvia, Michelle, and Carolyn, 
and I know there are other artists with the women of color who are a part of this uh, attending today, but thank you for this collaboration. It's very important. It's a real gift to all of us here in Minneapolis. Um, we Are the Story continues into um, early summer and we will be planning some special events in May. Hopefully people will be immunized and some of the quilters can make their way here to Minneapolis to see the quilts uh, in person. And um, But again, just thank you very much and uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Carl. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Carl, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Ray.